Welcome to the New York Studios, where you can watch us make the news. Today I'm with Mr. Phil McRae from Cornell University, who's one of the archivists overlooking their tremendous collection of literary documents, which come from letters, original manuscripts, and everything else that you'd expect. One of uh, Mr. McRae's specialities is memory in the First World War. And you've come today to talk about one person in the First World War whose activities have inspired many, but whose name is not known, Mr. Briefo. Mr. Briefo, he is not well known. Uh, he had a brief uh, passage as a best-selling author in 1937 with a novel. Uh, but he was educated as a cultural anthropologist, and, a, and he also had a medical degree. Mm -hmm. uh, so he's thought of as a philosopher and a, an author and a doctor. Uh, he was a surgeon during the First World War, both at Gallipoli and on the uh, Western Front. Okay. I mean, there's quite a large number of people in, in the West who became attracted to the, the medical aspect of the First World War yeah. and the, the ambulance battalions because they objected to the war. Was this part of his...? Uh, quite right. No. Well, he... Uh, uh, you might say he shared their sentiments, namely he was virulently anti-war, he was anti-British, though he served with uh, His Majesty's forces in both Gallipoli and the Western Front. Uh, he uh, had no use for England, uh, but like many of the people, uh, artists and philosophers and such, and pacifists, they could not stand by while their friends went to war. So that was, that was how he got there. Mm -hmm. And how did he respond to this, this, this carnage? Today, we look back on this in history, but, but to then this was a new and terrible saga yeah. in, in the depths of what humans can do to each other. Yeah, exactly. Um, he, he did, uh, there's a distinction between what he felt and what he, how he described it, which was rather pragmatic. Uh, he points out the number of uh, soldiers who shoot their feet off or their toes off to be excused from the war. Uh, he also points out that they will doubtless be executed for desertion. Uh, he, he describes horrific uh, passages, three days in a bunker under constant bombardment, and yet you don't get the sense that he is looking at it with the, the grand view of history. He's, um, I'm here now, the, the bombs will come and get me, or, or they won't. Uh, f fascinating kind of uh, attention to uh, um, the technical observation of the war. And your, your, your book, uh, Briefold's Passchendaele, which is one of the worst and most uh, dreadfully remembered yeah. battles yeah. of the First World War. First of all, I just want to raise the subtitle that mm -hmm. you've got for your book, Arts, Empathy, and the First World War. Mm -hmm. Now, how, how did all of this come together in the person of, of Mr. Briefold? first of all? I can say that uh, after graduate school, which now is 40 years ago, I found myself reading Ford Maddox Ford and uh, Joyce Hemingway, uh, and all of the British uh, <coughs> authors who uh, participated in the war. And somehow I managed to read all of those books without thinking they are in a war. It's, it struck me as a literary or uh, personal social experience they were describing. Uh, life goes on, <laughs> and then uh, some many years later I, I conclude that there is something about the war itself that, that must have changed all those persons and certainly the work that they produced after, after the war. I might say during and after the war because a good deal was produced during the war mm -hmm. and published. Um, but when, when we're talking about the First World War mm -hmm. and art, we, we tend to think of the same small group of poets right. whose, whose work is of course extremely valuable, Yes, but th there was much more going on in the artistic world and yeah. the artistic response to this. Yes, it, it's interesting to think about persons who were in the war that you might not expect. Uh, mm -hmm. You may know that uh, Angela Roncalli was uh, mm -hmm. in the war, Kokoschka, Clay, Egan Schele, Bertolt Brecht, 
he had limited service. He was served in a uh, venereal hospital, but he was during the war. Alban Berg, the, uh, whose opera Wojtek uh, maybe best uh, uh, summons the sense of, of horror and, and madness and uh, dislocation that the war occasioned for every soldier. Uh, Walter Gropius, Rilke, Mm -hmm. Fritz Kreisler was a uh, the famous violinist. Was uh, wrote a book called Four Weeks uh, in the Service." Uh, you might not expect him. Ravel, of course, uh, uh, served in the war, and uh, his uh, "Le Tombeau de Couperin." His piece is dedicated. Each movement is dedicated to a friend of his who was killed during the war. Uh, Billy Holiday's father was in the war. That's not something we <laughs> normally we think of. Albert mm -hmm. Camus' father was killed in the war. Mm -hmm. All of these things must have, uh, we assume, would, would uh, will have been uh, influences on the persons creating, uh, uh, trying to empathize with what happened during that war. Um, moreover, I might say, the, the, the premise of the centennial that we're experiencing yeah. now seems to be memory, like we must mm -hmm. remember this. Uh, I, I rather think that we should be concentrating on how, it, how we feel about it. And it's my thinking that artists can uh, shepherd us to that point of feeling what it was like to be in a trench for 15 days of constant rain and bombardment. Um, I'm not sure that uh, a blank description of that does it justice. I think this this is one of the things where where art can can speak to us through the generations and yeah. through it <coughs> can speak to us through the generations and through history. Yes, in a way that nothing else can. And you're talking about this on on the centenary, and your book's going to come out at, in the very symbolic date of November <laughs> the eleventh yes. this year. Yeah. But given that we're almost presented with if not a sanitized version of the First World War, it's one with pre-packaged, very easy to understand yeah. aspects. Yes. W uh, w what is you know, art doing? A simple thing. Um, Mary Borden was a rich uh, Chicago debutante who, though she had three children uh, and a good deal of money, mm -hmm. uh, put together a um, ambulance corps in the, on the Western Front and at one point she's uh, serving uh, in a nurse fashion uh, picking up people and so forth and she holds a fellow's head and um, his brain came out of his head having been uh, injured and then she realizes it was only half his brain and that sort of thing is not normally uh, uh, associated with um, plain description and uh, anybody who can't feel half a brain in their hand uh, I, I, I'm su I'd be very surprised if anybody can't imagine that um, that, yeah. that visceral and horror horrible thing which occurred to thousands and thousands and thousands of I mean, men we, in we, the trenches we, I mean there are so many individual accounts that come in but but where, where art seems to work in a way that a simple diarist can't yeah. is it can get over some kind of sense of the collective experience. Yeah. I mean, how has history kind of narrowed down the appreciation of the art? Because some seem to be almost kind of approved and, and a, a large number seem to have fallen into the abyss of memory, you know? <laughs> I, I, that's exactly right. That's why I'm more interested in empathy than in memory. Mm -hmm. um, there are many wonderful books that talk about our ways of remembering the war and commemorating it. Uh, but until we get there, until we get mud in our fingers, um, until our friend is exploded with a bomb, uh, I'm not sure we think of the war properly. And. Uh, this is an attempt to uh, remind ourselves that the modern artists, composers, painters, and writers 
all found an expression uh, and, a, and w a way with we can think about. Yeah. I mean, one of the other things about the First World War, you, you, you're talking about the empathy, which is the empathy for the common man, for each other. Yeah. And also, to a certain extent, the, the guy in the, the trench opposite you as well. Yes. There's, there, it's impossible to find any difference in the accounts from the, from the German and Austrian soldiers uh, and the Canadian, New Zealand, French, Belgian uh, soldier. American soldiers. There, it's impossible to find a difference. Uh, everybody is subjected to the same sort of thing. It's useful to remember that uh, the, the war came to an end. It wasn't exactly won or accomplished. It, it came to an end chiefly because um, the German people would not support it anymore. There was a lack of food, a lack of resources. It sort of petered out into nothingness um, which uh, strikes me as, uh, I mean, it couldn't have been more pathetic that, that all of this effort went into nothing. Passchendaele itself, the land of Passchendaele, which was won by Canadian soldiers in, uh, in November of 1917, was basically given back a short time later. Mm. Were we fighting for land? What, what were we doing there? So. Uh, think of it that way. I mean, this is, of course, as you remember, this is the death, deaths of millions of people, of the suffering through tens of millions of families for, for, for no result. And what we have to report on that now is, is the records of the, the journalists there who were often paid propagandists, and, and the artists who had to take time to assimilate yeah. and then allowed our experiences time to to come out you yeah. know whereas today we've got almost 24 hour video game yeah. kind of war in our front room yeah. uh, is there something particularly special about the first world war and how there was an artistic and cultural response to it well, one of the you bring up a terribly important point one of the uh, main commentators on the war uh, basically pitched the party line and it became evident that uh, he published a book in I think it was 1920 called Now It Can Be Told basically undoing everything he had written before mm -hmm. uh, so that ex explaining the futility uh, the horror uh, it's one thing to say there's gas but you know it's another thing to um, Talk about the effects, uh, the, the separation of your lungs coming out of orifices in your body. It's, uh, it's terrible. And also, I mean, one of the other things about gas is it, 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 it was the invisible enemy for many people. You you couldn't tell, and and that must have put absolute yeah. terror into well, the hearts of the soldiers. Uh, terror was their closest uh, companion. It was constant. Even behind the lines, they were dealing with it. Remember that um, F. 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 Scott Fitzgerald talks about something called non-combatants shell shock, which is uh, a way of our remembering that uh, certainly the soldiers who were there uh, took it with them to the end of their lives. Mm -hmm. But even if we were not there, it's capable of experiencing something like shell shock uh, because terror is so insidious. It's, mm. It fuses with our blood and breath, so to speak. So uh, the, the, uh, the essence of terror was uh, its ubiquity, basically. I mean, I'm, I'm sitting here as, as, as someone who gets paid to write and to use mm -hmm. words, and I'm just wondering, you, this may be where, where words fall down, someone once wrote about Auschwitz, is, this is where art stops. An interesting thought, and I don't think that we can proceed uh, in our thinking about the war without coming to that point. The thing that really amazes me, above all, is that I've read 
countless numbers of accounts uh, of experience during the trenches by shopkeepers, uh, teachers, people without a literary sense at all. Mm -hmm. And somehow the experience will press English language, German language, to uh, an exquisite expression. And I hadn't expected that. I thought that the uh, farmer from Manitoba would basically speak in that idiom about his experiences. Not so. There are numerous accounts that are written as exquisitely and as beautifully as anything you can imagine, as if language went past the uh, person experiencing the, 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 uh, uh, the trenches and uh, sort of bubbled up at the top and became uh, a very, very beautiful expression. Beautiful, of course, is where we can quarrel with, but uh, in this context, but I, I understand what you're saying, but I still think that it can be done. There are, mm -hmm. there are arts that can express it. Certainly Ravel's uh, Couperin, uh, each of, as I say, each of which, each movement of which is dedicated to a friend of his who died, uh, conveys something that nothing else can. Well, I think, I think is where, where art and culture really does, does succeed. I mean, it's in bridging this gap. I, I couldn't find the words to just, or I don't think I could, mm -hmm. but there may be something yeah. that, that can give us experience because it seems that what we have now with history, we've got the, the convenience of having an easy explainable past where myths become yeah. made out of history. And, and the way that yeah. artists and, and, and great people who work in great literature can challenge this in a way, way that no one else can. What I would like to ask you is bearing that in mind is yeah. we've heard all of the artistic responses to this new tragedy, this new debt that humanity had fallen into with the First World War. How did that resonate with ordinary people back home? I would emphasize that there was a delay. Uh, you'll, mm -hmm. uh, artists uh, understood the war from the beginning. Uh, it was some years before it had penetrated to the common culture, which I think is an interesting element. Remember that uh, uh, Stravinsky's Sacre de Printemps mm -hmm. came out before the war. and. Other uh, ballet russe came out before the war. There was just this uh, beginning of uh, new, the new art, the new modernist art. The war came, artists, uh, shall we say, responded to it. Mm -hmm. And it was a long, long time. And it, one might speculate about how long that would be. <laughs> Maybe it was as late as the 1960s when, mm -hmm. when uh, the, the refusal to be conscripted into the uh, forces that led to the war uh, could be challenged. Um, uh, a word comes to mind, uh, and that is suborning. And we don't use the word suborning very much day to day, but it, this is a, the, uh, the, in the sense that uh, people can be made to commit crimes that they have no interest in. Uh, it's a, a process by which um, certain po empowered and classed people can force others to commit crimes. I think, I think though, that is evident in every war when soldiers are sent into um, terrible harm. I think that uh, suborning is what the arts understood about uh, the First World War that was unique. Mm -hmm. And we uh, were able to read uh, the novels and, and plays and, and operas and, and listen to music that came from the war uh, in, in the sense that you know, this, is, this is not my war, why, why, why did you send me? And yet millions of men could be convinced to do that. Mm -hmm. So I think that's, that's the final uh, modern uh, lesson, but 
it didn't happen in 1918. It didn't happen in 1922. It didn't. Uh, it, it took a long time to percolate up till it became the uh, the common uh, voice of trans uh, uh, well, transgression. Yeah. yeah. But I mean, w w where where the things get interesting to me also is that, that in your work as an archivist, mm. uh, uh, working in these collections of, of, of literary documents, not just the, the the manuscripts, the letters, the notes, sure, everything that came up, is that we got after the First World War seemed to be for many people when when art could show us what we could not face or understand mm -hmm. and now that we have these and there are several universities and places like Cornell yeah. that have invested very heavily in getting these 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 collections together yeah. is it you also appear to be kind of a, a, a preservationist of almost human memory and experience by proxy as it were and remember that the last soldier at, at Passchendaele died in 2009. So we will never have the human voice again of someone who was there. That's impossible, that you and I can speak uh, as you were there. Uh, I hate to say it, but it's the next best thing, to look inside the mind of people who, uh, who were there and expressed it. Uh, we'll make do with that. Uh, whether or not we remember, I'm not too hopeful, but... I mean, I, I, I can understand that because uh, certainly the last British soldier who fought now was Harry Patch, who's a committed yeah. uh, pacifist and, and a man of, of tremendous personal ethics that seemed to contrast with mm -hmm. the horror yeah that he was sent to. If that's true, it is true, then it has to have been true for everyone. Uh, you might find somebody who was enthusiastic about the war after they had been in the trenches for a month, but not if they'd been there for the duration. There are no accounts of people who believed in the war uh, after they had been exposed to it. And I think this is where we come back to your, your essential point, is if we can look at these people who through an exposure to circumstances that no one thought mm. was possible, they managed to reach out and discover creativeness within in many That's cases. Right. Yeah. And also this other thing, once again, is, is an empathy and an understanding, not just of themselves, but also in, in people in the opposing sides who right. were equally trapped. Yeah. So, sure. Um, I might say a word about, uh, do you know the, do you know the uh, French artist Godier Brzezka? No, I don't. He was and a sculptor. Uh, let's can I tell you yeah, a minute? Please introduce um, an artist. He, to us. <laughs> he was uh, a very unconventional and brilliantly talented artist who was killed in 1915 uh, in the French army. But in 1912, mm -hmm. he visited the London Zoo and mm -hmm. uh, records the following. Um, yep. The beasts had a curious effect on me, which I haven't hitherto experienced. I have always admired them, but now I hate them. The dreadful savagery of these wild animals who hurl themselves on their food is too horribly like the way of humans. It's most depressing to see our own origin. Depressing not because we sprang from this, but that we may so easily slip back to it, a big war, an epidemic, and we collapse into ignorance and darkness, fit sons of chimpanzees. 1912. Now the war had uh, gotten started in the sense of militarism mm -hmm. and, and um, development, but that's intuitive, and that's the sort of uh, understanding that some, some men and women ex experiencing the war were able to, to re it was realize. It was like a cultural anthropology, anthropology on the hoof, you know, it was raw. They didn't have to study it or think it, it was there. 
you know, we are these chimpanzees. So. so I'd like to thank you very much for coming in and talking to these events. Sure. Over 100 years old, but still is absolutely important yeah. to us today. And the quotation that you've just read out says something. Because if we are people, and we are civilized and cultured people, we need to rise above our, the worst of ourselves and the worst of what we can do. And I said, uh, Mr. McRae's book is out on the 11th of November this year, um, and it's been praised already, and I've had a look through it, and there's a lot of fascinating stuff in there, and you will definitely learn something, not just about the First World War, but about what it is to be human. Thank you very much. Thank you.